organized uh, by Fashion Manipulation Institute by Stecco. For me, uh, this evening, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce uh, you, another important member of the family of the Fashion Manipulation. And uh, uh, the topic uh, is a real uh, interesting. Uh, this member is uh, Colin Whiteford, is a physical therapist in a private practice in the United States. Uh, she and uh, her husband, uh, also a uh, physical uh, therapist, have been uh, in practice together for 35 years and have uh, four clinics in Virginia and North, North Carolina. She's a certified specialist and structure in facial manipulation method. And uh, the topic uh, uh, of uh, uh, Colleen is a pelvic health uh, and uh, an external uh, approach. Uh, is it possible uh, to make a question uh, during uh, uh, the speech uh, of a calling with uh, the question marks at the bottom uh, on the right of uh, uh, your uh, uh, your screen? So we can start. The platform uh, is uh, of Colleen and uh, good speech and let's go. Thank you, Carmelo. So hello, thanks for the introduction. And it's really an honor to be here to have a chance to share this with you because I've, I've learned a lot about pelvic health and I've enjoyed it. And I hope that I can maybe remove some barriers for some people who might also be open to it and considering it. Um, as Carmelo said, we are in Virginia in the US and I'll tell you more about our practice and what it looks like as far as pelvic health is concerned. I just wanted to put my contact information up here for you. And that's my email, which if anybody wants to contact me by email, that's a great way to catch me. And I've also just uh, one hour ago launched my new blog site, which has become a project in and of itself. And that's the address down there. It's called fearfullywonderfullymade.life. And I think there's supposed to be a backslash after life. I can't get it to work right now, <laughs> which is a little bit unsettling, but it's not going to ruin my day. And at some point it will work. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that uh, later on. But this is just some ways to contact me and reach out if you'd like to chat some more. So thank you to the Fashion Manipulation Association for hosting this and giving us the opportunity to have this, this kind of presentation. And thanks to all of you guys for being here and taking time out of a busy, perhaps clinic day or evening, and to just give some attention and time to something that I really see as important. And I hope you will see why soon. So moving on, oh, great. So there are a lot of diagnoses that are associated with pelvic health. And I don't even know that I've got them all on here, but this is kind of what I came up with, um, just thinking about it off the top of my head and putting them in alphabetical order. There's a ton of diagnoses and some of them are rather, um, intimidating. And when I first started working with pelvic health, there were a lot of words that I came across that I really hadn't heard before, and I didn't know what they meant. Um, it's been an a interesting trip. There are also a lot, uh, or is a lot of equipment that's associated with pelvic health. And you see some of it here. Um, and not all pelvic health clinicians use this or have this. I don't have anything that's up here. You'll see a little bit more about equipment that I use later. There are a lot of courses that can be associated with pelvic health, at least in the United States. Um, this is from one of the providers for pelvic health courses. And this is, even, is not listing everything that you could possibly take in relation to learning more about pelvic health. There's, there's an awful lot of coursework. And for many people, a lot of it culminates into a certification that's associated with pelvic health. So this is in the United States. We have specializations in different practice segments and the pelvic health has its own board certification. It's, it's an arduous task to get certification in any of them, including pelvic health. And you hear me saying women's health, physical therapy, um, pelvic health and women's health is kind of um, interchangeable terms the way that we look at it here. There's also some assumptions that are associated with pelvic health and what I'm trying to imply here is that oftentimes it's it's thought that there's always internal work done for pelvic health um, by sometimes assumed by the patients, sometimes assumed by a physician, sometimes assumed by the clinician. But it often goes hand in hand when people think about pelvic health, 
they're thinking that means internal pelvic health. And when you put all these factors together, this can be pretty intimidating and overwhelming, especially to a clinician who doesn't do pelvic health, who sees these diagnoses, who sees this equipment, who sees all this coursework, who sees the certification, who thinks about it's all internal. And it may be enough to just make a clinician say, you know what, <laughs> I'm not doing this. I'm not going there. That I just, I'll ignore the pelvic segment in the body. But you know, we work with a whole body, we should. And as clinicians, we can't just say, you know, there's a part of the body that I'm just gonna ignore. I'm not gonna do anything with that. And if somebody comes up with a diagnosis that is on that list, I'm either gonna just gloss over it or I'm gonna refer them to somebody else. So maybe they'll come to one person for one diagnosis and go to someone else for another diagnosis that relates to the pelvis. But I wanted to share this, as, and I couldn't fit any more on here really, as you can see, but this is kind of what my practice looks like. Um, for me, I, I'm comfortable working with any and all of these, sometimes more with one diagnosis than another, but I put the pelvic diagnoses that I could fit in here, they're in red over there. And I used to not be able to do those, but in, in becoming more comprehensive and global with how I approach working on the body, it just naturally enfolded the pelvic diagnoses. I really didn't set out intending to get into them, but it just happened when you look at a total body approach. And my training for pelvic is quite frankly, very minimal. These are some of the instructors that I've had courses with and I am trained in pelvic internal, but it's very minimal. My training is much heavier in orthopedics. And this is another practice specialty in the United States. I've been a board certified specialist in orthopedic physical therapy since 2000. And I just renewed it again for 10 years. And that takes me to 2030. And after that, I'm not renewing it anymore. <laughs> Maybe I'll be retired by then. But um, my training, my coursework, my emphasis has always been much stronger in orthopedics. But as I learned about the fascia manipulation and as I pursued training with it. I went for certification in 2018 and then as an instructor in 2019, I just found myself not being able to exclude that part of the body. It really opened up my practice and quite by accident, I found myself getting results with these pelvic cases when I had never marketed them. I actually started just bringing that into my orthopedic caseload and right now, I, I had to think about this and I'm not sure how accurate I am, but I guess I would say my current caseload is probably 60 to 70% pelvic. And some of these people come directly to me because I do pelvic work. Some of them come with orthopedic problems, but we draw the pelvic problem into it because I can't separate the two. So it's, it's a real mix in the caseload, but I'm always open to including not just the pelvic, not just the orthopedic, but both of them, because quite honestly, I just, I don't think I can separate them. So I wanna tell you a story. And that sounds to me a little more appealing than saying, I wanna give you a case report. So we'll call it a story. And in the United States, um, our, our tendency is to sort of silo practice, whether we're talking about physical therapy or whether we're talking about um, medicine, you know, physicians, in that you'll see an orthopedist for one thing, um, a physical therapist might only work in orthopedics, another one might only work in pediatrics, another one might only do pelvic health. But this was a story that I thought would be good for illustrating this, this whole talk because this case, this story, involves all three of these. So it begins with a 15-year-old girl who was referred to our office for rehabilitation after she dislocated her left patella. And you also see that the um, prescription read that she had a medial patellar femoral ligament tear. Honestly, she didn't have an MRI, so I think that was an assumption. And she was referred for basic strengthening and what they called extensive patellofemoral rehab. When she arrived, she was wearing a knee immobilizer and her knee was very swollen, painful. She was on crutches and she wouldn't bear much weight on the leg. So as I was taking her history, her mom was with her for the first visit and I, you know, you asked the typical questions and I asked, well, what happened? How did you end up dislocating your patella? 
And she said, basically, she was just walking, just walking along one day. She felt this awful pain. It caused her to fall down. And that's how it happened. There was no real trauma, no really good, strong explanation for it. The only thing that I could get out of her that might have had any bearing on it was that she related a a month maybe prior to the whole event happening where her knee felt kind of funky and it just didn't feel right, but she really didn't have anything that even caused her to speak up or say anything about it. So that got me as, that got my attention as being kind of odd. But anyway, so we get her, her intake sheet. This is just what ours looks like. I use bright green paper so I can find it easily in the paper chart. And so the left knee was her site of pain. That was her main complaint, her primary complaint. Previous, finally, she told me after I pushed and pushed for her past medical history, she had sprained her ankle in middle school about six years prior. And I really questioned her as to whether she was sure it was the right ankle. She wasn't entirely sure about that, but both her and her mom felt pretty confident that it was the right ankle. In my head, I kind of thought maybe it was the left and that would explain why then she hurt her left knee. But regardless, I put it down as the right ankle because that's what they said. So we moved ahead with her rehabilitation for her patellofemoral dislocation. We worked on mobility, we worked on strength, and we worked on um, weight bearing and improving her ability just to walk. And all was going well. I didn't give her stretching because I wanted this to remind me to say that she was hypermobile. And a lot of the people that I see in practice, I don't think my practice is uh, anything different than most people's, but I recognize hypermobility. And I feel like I see it in an awful lot of the people that I see more female than male, but I see more females than males too, as probably most of us do. So I didn't give her much in terms of stretching at all. I focused more on the other elements Um, and things were going good. She was moving along, progressing nicely toward her, her goal of being able to get back to life as normal until she posed this question to me. And she, she said this, how do I know this won't happen to me again? And, you know, I thought for a 15 year old, that's a pretty perceptive question. That's a very good question because it really implies that we would understand why it happened in the first place. And remember, I mean, this thing occurred idiopathically. You know, we didn't have a trauma. We didn't have an explanation for why this happened. So if we don't know why it happened the first time, chances are good. Maybe it's going to happen again. And in the whole spectrum of things, there's nobody else who's going to figure out why did this happen? So um, I accept the challenge. I like challenges. And I thought we need to figure out why a kneecap, a patella would dislocate all on its own. There's always a reason for things happening in the body. So I wanted to see, I looked at her harder. I took these pictures because I thought someday this is going to be a great story. And here it is. So actually I've used this several times. And what do you see when you look at this? And I wish I could hear what people say, but I can't. But think about it. Here's what I see. I drew these lines or I added them on because this is what I see. I see that she has genuvalgus in both limbs, but it's stronger on the left. And remember, the left side was the one that she dislocated the patella on. And she also has a little bit of inversion in the right foot. It's kind of turning in there. So my next question to you would be, why would we see this? What in the world could be driving this for her? Well, lots of thoughts, but mine is, it's almost like something's pulling. There's some kind of force that's pulling and rearranging her anatomy. Uh, I didn't, sorry, I think I'm about ahead of where I wanted to be. Maybe, sorry, lost my place. Anyway, pulling. So, no, I was in the right place. So, some kind of force pulling. So, when she started with me, she was so swollen and painful, I couldn't. Um, I couldn't palpate her the way I really wanted to, that everything hurt. But now that she's post-acute and we're ready to go a little bit deeper into the why did this happen, I'm ready to use a different kind of palpation besides just seeing what's generally tender. And I'm looking at tissue layer palpation. I really like using this picture. I use it a lot when I'm talking to patients and teaching classes because I think it, even though in the body it doesn't look quite this neat and orderly and layered, it, it depicts what's going on pretty well. And what what I I like to point out is that what I'm really interested in, yeah, these tissues need to be considered, but for the moment, I'm going to focus on the deep fascia. And it looks like one thick layer in here, but it's really not. It's multiple layers, like we can see on this image from um, real-time ultrasound. 
So here's the deep fascia showing in this part of the body, three layers that have some separation and space between them. Here's the muscle, the superficial fascia, which is bilaminar, and then up at the skin, pretty much like what we just saw in that depiction in that, that uh, drawing. And that's what I'm palpating for. And really, if we break down that the three layers, what we see here on the medial aspect of the elbow from this cadaver sample is you get a sense that there's different directions to it. And that's because it's collagen fiber bundles laid down parallel to each other by layer, but each layer is facing a different direction and thought to control movement in that direction. But there has to be space between the layers and there has to be slide. And the a on the left side, I guess it is, um, is showing that. That's normal function, what we want. B would depict or show a densification, where instead of there being space and slide, it's compromised. And we've lost the space, and things, instead of sliding on each other, are adhered together. And my patients always want to know, why has this happened? How did this happen to me? And I tell them, overload, like this poor little donkey here, or whatever he is. Uh, overload, and overload looks like Maybe it happens from an injury or a trauma, like my girl with her ankle sprain, repetitive movements or immobilization, where the viscosity of the ground substance just gets changed and things can't move the way they're supposed to anymore. So in her, I'm very interested in palpating this way, feeling for those deep fascia layers in the segment of her knee. Knee is represented here as G for genu, it's Latin. And I'm not interested in everywhere around her knee. I'm interested specifically in these points where there's either a center of coordination or a center of fusion, which I have labeled here with different colors and different shapes. And I wanna know, is there a densification that's happening here? I'm not as concerned if it happens over here. I'm mostly concerned about these precise points because they're going to have more of an impact on movement. Now, I'm trusting that perhaps Many, if not all of you are at least a little bit familiar with these constructs because I didn't want to spend all my time introducing them and reviewing them. I put this one slide in to just say that those points are arrived at by looking at where there are muscle spindles and where they are fired in order to make movement happen in a segment in one particular direction. That's what the, the uh, triangles are. That's what the circles are, sort of and it comes together at that one point. That's why I'm interested in that. And there's a lot more information on this that goes deeper in other webinars. So on her, I palpate the segment of Genu and here's what I find. The colors are a little close, but I hope you can tell that I find her bilateral, both knees, anti meaning the front, lateral meaning the outer aspect of the body and Genu for the knee. On the on anti-lateral genu, I find it on both sides. On the left side, the side that she hurt, it's on the back side as well for retrolateral genu. But I have more to do. So remember back to that um, ankle sprain in her original drawing. Now, I'm still not trusting completely that it's the right side. I'm a person who likes to palpate both sides anyway. It helps me be sure of what I'm feeling, but it also helps the patient feel the difference between the right side and the left side. So I palpate both sides. And again, I'm in the same construct of, I'm only interested in these points, the centers of coordination, the centers of fusion in the segment of talus. And here's what I find on her. In both ankles, she has densification, but it's actually worse on the left side than the right. Now, is that really the side that she sprained? I don't know, I, I'll never know, um, but it doesn't really matter. That's what I'm finding. So now that I've got stuff in both legs, I'm kind of thinking, hmm, well, a right leg, a left leg, I wonder if there's something in the middle. Because after all, between the two, there's a pelvic segment that may be harboring some dysfunction as well, and that might be why she has problems on both sides. So I go back, and you haven't seen the flip side of her pain diagram, and I'm gonna give this to you in large, but what she finally told me after I really pulled it out of her and her mom is that she had some dysfunction in the, in the endocrine system. So she had what's called dysmenorrhea, which is basically just the big name for she had a dysfunctional menstrual cycle. Her onset, or the name for it is menarche, was at age 11, which isn't abnormal. But what is abnormal is that she suffered with heavy bleeding, pain, she missed school, she missed social activities. They put her on multiple oral contraceptives, pain pills, nothing helped. She lived with it for two years, and finally at the age of 13, they inserted an intrauterine device which worked wonderfully for her, but that's a very drastic measure in a 13-year-old. 
So that told me, yep, there's something in the pelvic segment. So here was my, my hypothesis of what perhaps went on with this girl. I'm, and I'm thinking, uh, I like a timeline. That's what I tried to draw at the bottom there. Now, the first thing that happened was she sprained the ankle in middle school. Second thing that happened was she had her onset of her menstrual cycle and it was manifesting immediately as dysfunctional, maybe because of unresolved problems down in that right ankle. And then finally, the, the problem continues to spread and manifests as her third problem, now with this idiopathic dislocation in her left patellofemoral joint. So that was my hypothesis. And I went ahead and palpated the segment of pelvi or pelvis. And this is what I found on her. And I'm, again, back to the same construct with the centers of coordination, centers of fusion. And I found that these were densified on her in the same tissue line as what I found in the lower extremities, that anti-lateral line. So I went to work on her. And we worked on all the sites that I found, not necessarily in one visit, but I just captured a few with some, some photos of working on anti-lateral, the, the diagonal. And I also, this might be a little different for some people to see, but I use these people in treatment, partly because I run behind and it helps. So I have her using a hypervolt. Um, I like percussion tools. I think they help prep the tissue so that it doesn't take as long to then manually shear it and restore that normal space and slide. But it also, I think it gives a little bit of a distraction because what I'm doing on her right knee hurts and what she's doing on her left knee doesn't. I just think it's good too to let them participate in their care, especially when I'm working with a 15 year old. Um, I, I just, she enjoyed it, she would sit up and what I would do then is switch sides. I'd go do the manual work on the left while I had her do percussion on the right. And I'm working on the right knee partly because I found dysfunction there, but I like to think that what I'm doing there is preventing her from dislocating that patella at some point in the future. And if you remember back to my comment about the hypermobility, that has a lot to do with, I think, why she dislocated, because her tissue just doesn't have the normal stops to movement. You put a densification on top of hypermobility and it can pull and do anything. So this was just one treatment session and what it looked like. So this was on her last visit with me. It was, I saw her for six visits and she was happy, excited, doing well, certainly out of her brace, walking much better, feeling better. And she did a squat for me. And I know this was upon arrival because she's wearing cutoff shorts and I don't treat people in cutoff shorts because I can't work through it and it's too hard to work around it. So I had her change into some stretchy shorts, sport shorts, and then I treated her. And then this is what happened after. She almost fell down because we got that much more accomplished with her mobility. And she wanted to take the picture again. I said, nope, this one's perfect. I love it. Because it showed that she, she got further change. So she really did very well with it all. Now, I can't know what's going on with the dysmenorrhea. I, I doubt I completely resolved it as much as I would like to. And maybe I'll see her again at some point in the future. But, but at least it was a start for helping her knee. And I think a start for helping some of her dysmenorrhea. So now answering this question for her, I can't say I got it all taken care of, but I feel like at least we're making an attempt to get at what might be a probable cause, some of the root behind the problem. So here she is full squat. And that's my little dog down there too. And doing well, as far as I know, I follow up for six months, but I haven't, I haven't talked to her for a little bit. So hopefully she's doing very well. And I'd love to see her when she's ready to maybe try to have kids and see how she's doing with the dysmenorrhea and resolution of that. So just that's my story with her. And I wanna share a little bit from, this was a summit. Uh, maybe some of you saw this with lots of good presenters, including Carla Stecco. And she, her part was on the, the pelvic floor fascia. And this segment of it, she was talking about interaction between the musculoskeletal system and the visceral mechanism. And she talked about three possible point or mechanisms for a relationship between the two and what those would look like. The first one she talked about was points of fixation through ligaments or anchorages. And for me, when I'm, when I'm trying to explain to a patient why I'm doing what I'm doing, I'll often use this picture. And I'll talk about the fact that, you know, our organs, they're inside of us. They're not just free floating around in there. There's a lot of fascia that relates them to each other, connects them together appropriately as needed but it's also 
anchored to the trunk wall so that when you turn on your side, when you turn a cartwheel, when you move around, your organs just don't jumble around as individuals or they don't um, jumble around as one big mass. They have to be fixed to the trunk at very precise points. And if we know where those points are, which is what some of these points are, then this is how we can have an impact on the underlying organ by working externally. Um, I often tell people it's really not the organ that's the problem. It's the environment that the organ is trying to function in. And that's why maybe a lot of these tests that look at the organ don't show anything because the organ's not the problem. It's the environment. So a second point that she presented in this whole construct of relationship between musculoskeletal and visceral is the concept of the container and the contents. And I liked this illustration that she brought in of just thinking about like a water balloon. And maybe we're talking about the bladder here, but we could be talking about the stomach. It's kind of all the same. But that these organs are inside this container, the trunk, and they're counting on the muscles and the fascia to be elastic, adaptable, and to allow them to move, modify their volume because your bladder, your stomach, the colon, all these organs change in size and the trunk has to be able to accommodate that. So if there's rigidity in the trunk, it's gonna be like this rubber band around this water balloon. It's not gonna be able to accommodate it. And then we feel like there's a problem with the underlying organ when it's really not the organ. She went on to present a third point with this, and this is talking about the distal tensors, which is basically referring to the limbs. And in the case of when we're talking about pelvic, we're really gonna focus more on the lower limb because there's such a strong biomechanical relationship between the lumbar, pelvic segments and the lower limb, because we walk around on them all the time. There's a strong biomechanical alliance between them. There's also a strong anatomical alliance, and that's what she was showing here when she was looking at the continuity, continuity between the trunk and then down into the lower limb and even to the contralateral side. And I just pulled out some of her comments and I put them over that same picture, so you're not missing anything. But she was talking about how there's a crossing over. The external oblique fascia crosses at the symphysis pubis, moves toward the contralateral lower limb and toward the medial region, mostly in the adductors. And that this fascia is in continuity with the fascia of the pelvic floor. It's amazing. Here, we're just carrying this further down the lower extremity into the, the distal tensor of the lower limb. The lower limb isn't as elastic. It doesn't have to respond to changing volume of an organ underneath. It has to do more with force transmission. And so the fascia down in the lower limb is gonna be not as elastic, but more, more thickened and have more collagen in it. But what she's commenting to here is that tension can be transmitted through the limb from above to below and from below up. And this is just, I think, a, a perfect example of it, a hammer toe, that this could be caused by excessive tension coming from the trunk this could exert an, a force on the trunk. So it works both ways from proximal to distal, distal to proximal. And we can work in both areas to impact a change on the underlying organ. So this was a lady I saw for urinary incontinence among other things, but this is the model that I use, all external work. I worked on her, her talus there. I think I'm doing antilateral talus as well as antilateral pelvis. it looks like. I put these pictures in of her feet because I wanted to just illustrate the points made earlier that the feet, the lower limb, the ankle, the segment of talus, they're all really important in this, in this whole construct of working with the internal organ through the distal tensor, as well as through the, the canister or the trunk. And she had a lot of dysfunction with the toenails. Um, and you can see how reddened this one is. I like having people take their socks off and let me see their toenails. I have a I document about toenail health and when they're wearing colored nail polish, I, I note that, but I ask them about it. So toenail fungus, ingrown, thickened toenails to me is all a reflection of abnormal tension, maybe even arising as far into the toe as all the way, almost halfway down the toenail. But you can see from her how, how rigid her arches are. She's got overactive uh, toe extensors, lots of dysfunction for this lady down into her distal tensor. So I threw this in because urinary incontinence, a lot of times people think, well, you need to do kegels. And, you know, there's not a lot of solid evidence to support that. And there's a lot of people who could attest to the fact that it really doesn't do that much for them. I thought this was kind of funny. This was from, well, the Women's Health, the section of Women's Health magazine. 
Um, yeah, it's presented, It's to me it's the same as if you came into me for knee pain and I told you, you need to do a quad set. I don't know how many, you just need to do a million of them, do them all day long, do them forever. It's kind of where people go with kegels sometimes, but there is a case that I hope I have time to get to with you where I did use kegels. I don't use it often, but every now and then it, it has a place. This was another case of urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. And this woman had significant densifications down into her, the lower limb, as Carla was showing with, you know, the movement of the, the fascia down to the medial aspect of the limb. Here, I worked on this woman in a site called Medio Genu, and she had some pretty significant involvement down there. This is from perhaps a, a text that you're familiar with, uh, the Travell and Simons manuals on trigger points. And this drawing just depicts I think a lot of what Carla Stecco was talking about with the relationship of the fascia from the lower limb up into the pelvic floor that can give you the perception of referred pain into that region. Maybe it's because of the fascia as well and the relationship there. And this is taking it back to that um, fascia research online summit where Carla was talking about how complicated it is the way that the, the fascia has different names throughout this area. So I'm just pulling out words over the picture from her comments, that it's complicated because it all has so many different names. There's one name for the fascia of the bladder, another for the uterus, another for the levator ani or the pelvic floor muscles, another for the fascia of the rectum. And it really makes it hard to process that it's all connected and it's all the same. People focus on the part they deal with and yet don't understand that it's related to another specialties area, like there's gynecology in there, there's urology, there's internal medicine, but everybody gets in their own compartment and they don't realize the relationship between them all. Taking this further, looking at scarpa and Kali's fascia in the lower part of the pelvis and the continuity of it. She comments that scarpa's fascia relates very heavily to the fascia of the, the lower limb, pelvic floor and all, all connected. Any type of alteration can bother the organs and the, the tissues in the lower limb as well as into the trunk. So this is looking at a posterior view of the, the ligaments and the fascial bundles that are back there. And she commented the external anal sphincter is connected to the coccyx by a fascial bundle. And this might have some impact on the next story that I'm going to share with you. This was a lady um, who makes me look like a shrimp. Uh, she was she came from South Africa, not to see me. She moved here and she now lives local, but I got to see her and I enjoyed working with her. It was her first baby overdue, labored eight hours, finally induced. She sustained a fourth degree perineal laceration, which is about as bad as it gets for tearing. And it's called an oasis. It's a funny name. It's, it's no paradise. It can be pretty debilitating. She suffered uh, from fecal incontinence, urinary incontinence, pain with penetration of of the vagina and understandably an aversion to having any more children. She didn't want anything to do with it. Um, so her past medical history, it, you can see what's up here and it kind of breaks my heart because to me, we had multiple opportunities to try to intervene and help this woman so that it didn't go where it went for her, but I didn't get to meet her until after she had that, that first child with all those complications. But I would suggest to you that this kind of history was signaling a problem that it, it would have been good to try to address before she ever even got pregnant. But I saw her for six visits. We worked on fascia manipulation. We did very minimal exercise. Home instruction for her was the perineal massage. And now that I'm thinking of it, I should have put up here too. She's one I gave kegels to because she had, she had a surgical site in the pelvic floor. She had sutures. And to me, that's reasonable to give her some work to do for muscle re-education. It's probably one of the few times that I, I use a Kegel though. And she had 100% resolution, which was lovely. She was pleased with that. And so was I. And she sent me this email saying, hey, I'm doing good. This was about almost a year afterwards. No accidents, meaning fecal or urinary. And baby's doing good. Everybody's happy. So I don't know if she's going to have another one, but maybe I'll see her someday again. So... Um, in summary of that, all those comments from Carla Stecco, basically there's continuity between the visceral fascia and the locomotor system and the trunk and the lower limb. Um, pelvic floor is not alone. Total continuity, a strong relationship. Locomotor system relates to the internal organs 
and that their elasticity is key. You can't just worry about fixing the position of the pelvis. Like, is there is there a rotation? Is there an upslip, a downslip? Is there a sacroiliac joint problem? Well, I think there's more to think about than just those elements. Elasticity in the trunk is key. Okay, and the literature supports this too. This is a study from the, our, our journal, the Physical Therapy Journal, where they basically found that there's association between urinary incontinence and back pain. Another article from the same issue journal, journal issue, where they looked at hip mobility and by addressing this, we're able to help urinary incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse. So same constructs. This was a nice article from one of our um, fashion manipulation instructors in Italy, Andrea Pacini. And very similar to my case, actually my story of a female with dysmenorrhea, knee pain in the one session. These were the points that they treated and she did very well with that. And across the literature, again, you can find multiple sites. This one looking at 75% of the people in the study reported pain beyond just their pelvic pain, but at additional sites. So it's throughout the literature. Um, all these diagnoses, you know, there's a lot there, a whole lot there. And what I just want to comment to with this is that it's really about the same as if someone comes to you for neck pain or knee pain. You're going to ask different questions and they just have to be specific so that you can know how to mark change. So when you're talking about bladder issues, for instance, there are specific changes questions that you'd want to ask, like this is, I broke it down this way. I can't do every one of these diagnoses, but these are some of the things that I ask about so that I can quantify it because it's, it can be hard to measure. Otherwise, it's not like a movement test or a painful knee. So I ask about pads. I ask about how many times do you get up at night? Um, is there any unintentional loss of urine? No amount is normal. Men, it behaves a little bit differently. I also put don't overlook the bowels in there because a lot of times um, urinary incontinence has an element of influence from constipation and it has to be addressed, especially in kids. Bladder problems, I wanna know the history the same as anybody else I'm seeing. Do they have old fractures? Do they have coexisting concomitant issues? Do they have surgical sites anywhere? All of that's the same for all my patients. Inspection, I wanna see tibial torsion. I think this was the same person. Look at this point here. It's definitely different from over the year. Something's going on. There's a lot of force happening there. Excessive lordosis, back to the toes and the health. What's happening at the shoulders? What's happening at the feet? What about the skin? Is there a leg length discrepancy? All these, these elements matter. I use movement, but it may not be the most informative when I'm doing a, a pelvic person because there may not be any movement dysfunctions but I will check and make a note of it. I really like using a squat because it's quick, it's easy. And what I do, I do two steps with it. If this person can squat this far down with their heels down, then I just note that. But if they're stuck up higher, I have them raise up their heels and squat just with the four feet on the ground. If they can go a lot further, then that's absolute confirmation to me that there's some kind of restriction somewhere in the foot and somewhere in the calf I knew I was going to be working there anyway, but it gives me a test retest measure. This young lady who's pregnant um, had pain, sciatica, with getting up on her bed. So that was my movement test with her. So I used a gesture. I palpate. I've already talked about that, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. And in the bladder cases, I'm very interested in the segment of the lumbar, segment of the pelvis, talus, has. And then, of course, I may want to palpate genu and coxa because they're in there also. But these are the ones that I'm going to mainly begin with. I'm looking for a relationship and maybe trying to connect the dots or draw a line between them all. In treatment, my first go-to is fashion manipulation. I may be working anywhere on the body, but for the most part, that lower half of the body for the pelvic problems. I also use other things in treatment. Um, lots of things you see here. Exercise. I like hula hoops therapy balls. We have a laser uh, and my dogs are my secret weapon, especially with the children. They help make them laugh. I love cupping. Needling can be very nice as well. Uh, I have a lot of brochures I've written because I believe in educating people in as far as what's wrong with their body and how they can participate in their own care. And I have a, a new a blog site website that I just launched, as I mentioned earlier, an hour ago. It wasn't working very good for me. I'm not sure, but I think it might work. I think it needs a backslash after life right there. So if you want to check it out, it's 
my intent is to educate my patients and give them a source to go to, but also to have it be something that's informative for other clinicians as well, just to guide them along with some of the pelvic stuff, but really not just limited to that. And this is my nod to biopsychosocial. I bring patients here to say, you know, there's a lot of things that play into what might be causing your pelvic problem. We want to change maybe how you're moving, maybe the daily activities. We'll change what we can change in here, and maybe what we can't change won't matter so much. So treatment elements that I incorporate, you see here. These are my go-tos, and I also do a lot with education using these points of, of intervention for them. And I really like equipping people and teaching them how to participate in their own care. And I use that construct with all these diagnoses. It doesn't matter which one. I just question it and frame it and reassess a little bit differently according to it. I have two case reports. I had no idea how the time would go. I'm gonna go through them quickly. You can just see some examples of how this works. So this was a guy, ski instructor, really good skier, so he told me, and multiple crashes, lots of injuries, but 15 year history of recurrent kidney stones, always on the right side. Here were his internal dysfunction symptoms. He was really referred for just pelvic flank pain of unknown origin, and that was all I had to go on. Um, when I got his intake, he had so many crashes and all, it really didn't tell me. I was kind of like, well, we're gonna be looking everywhere. But I thought this was really interesting. Remember, the, the uh, kidney problems were always on the right side. And I thought, wow, gee, that's quite a bunion that he's got there. I wonder if it has anything to do with this problem. And here we are back to the lower extremity for taking care of this problem. So uh, these were the points I found the first day. I worked with him approximately five visits. I think he didn't show for his last one, um, but he was doing a lot better by that time. That's probably why he didn't show. Um, who knows if he'll go for 15 more years without a kidney stone? I don't know. I'd be interested to follow up and see how it goes for him. But he did very well within that short time. I even worked on his shoulder some. These were some of the tools that I used with him. This is a vibration roller. I like having it prep areas so that when I go to them, they're not so tender and painful for people. All right, last one. Little cutie pie here, four years old, constipated since birth. Uh, so bad that finally the pediatrician said to mom, you know, it's time for daily enemas on your four-year-old. <laughs> that is heartbreaking. So she brought her to me. I treated the mom for pelvic problems and the mom brings the child. That's how it goes. So we did movement testing. It wasn't revealing of anything, but we had a lot of fun with it. Um, and this is what I found. She was an antilateral retrolateral. We worked on those. I saw her for one visit, taught mom how to use some tools. They had some tools at home and in follow-up by phone, she did fine with it. The children are very easy to change. Um, so that kind of wraps up what I had ready for you. I wanted to put this up again, just so that you can, if you're interested in contacting me, I, I, I'm here. Uh, I'd love to have you sign up for my blog site. If that doesn't work, just shoot me an email. And at some point I'll try to make it work right, but I think it, it doesn't have to have a capital F. It doesn't, it does have a backslash on the end, I think. And that was what I had. And this is my dog, one of them. Oh, this is Grace. Thank you all for your time, for your attention. And I hope that this might remove some barriers that you might have toward doing pelvic health. Uh, I think is uh, really interesting the possibility to use the facial manipulation and the facial manipulation point of view to solve uh, this problem that sometimes uh, uh, they uh, seem uh, they seem a sort of organic problem, but in reality there is an alteration and dysfunction of the fashion. Uh, so I have uh, my curiosity. Uh, are, um, you, for example, uh, in uh, uh, this menorrhea. Uh, you have a lot of patients uh, that treat uh, with the facial manipulation and uh, the results uh, about uh, this, uh, uh, this method uh, in, uh, uh, in this type of patients. Um, I don't have as many patients with dysmenorrhea, dysmenorrhea as I would like. Uh, and that's kind of a, a, a soapbox lecture of mine. I think I, I see more of these women later on when they get into bigger problems 
And usually what I'm hearing is when I'm trying to get their history and get their oldest problem. And I ask about, did you have problems when, when you started your cycle? And it's, it's heartbreaking how often women say yes. Um, I, I don't think there's really a lot of appreciation for how much can be done, especially for dysmenorrhea with fashion manipulation method and early intervention. So I see these people like the one, the one you saw that had so much trouble in birth. And I really believe that a lot of issues with pregnancy, labor, and delivery, if we would just get to them earlier, that we could avoid that. And, and who knows what kind of what kind of change that might make in cesarean section rates and all. I start, I'd love to do a study on that. I, I'm in my little office. I, I should do a case report first. That would be a great place to start. But I don't see as much as I'd like to. But that's one thing I want to do with my blog site because that's going to be one of my blog posts. And that's why I wrote the Dysmenorrhea brochure, which is you can get on my website. Uh, it's on there. You can download it and you can use it, share it with people. But yeah, I don't see as much of it as I want to. I see them later in life. And, you know, it'd just be nice to intervene earlier. Yes, I think I think that it's an important field because sometimes there is an alteration, an hormonal alteration. But uh, uh, this hormonal alteration uh, has uh, an organic basis uh, on the uh, on the fascia. But uh, we have uh, questions by, by our colleagues. Uh, by one moment, by Cathy. Uh, um, how long are you your average uh, treatment sessions? Oh, that's that's a fair question. Too long. <laughs> I get in trouble. Um, we schedule roughly 30 minutes a session, but it, it runs over. Um, part of that's built in like the airlines. We, we might overbook because we sort of think that, you know, somebody's not going to show up maybe. Or, you know, there's, the schedule is always fluid. But technically on paper, we schedule every 30 minutes. But I try, I block out an, um, a, a blank 30 minutes in the middle of my morning and middle of my afternoon because I'm always running behind. I, I just do it. And it's it, part of it's I, I just I spend too long with people and I, I need to be more timely with it. But um, usually about 45 minutes, something like that. And I can make it work, though. That's where the tools are nice, because if I'm really running behind, I'll leave. I'll give the patient. I'll have them hold the vibration roller on their stomach while I, I I'll leave it on like intra pelvic or whatever it is. And I'll go get another person started and I might come back in then and, and take that off and finish the other person. So sometimes I have more than one person, you know, going in treatment at the same time. But yeah, that's that's about right. And I, I use some exercises to the pelvic ball. So if I don't if I can't get to them right away, then they'll they'll do some of the other elements of their treatment. But we but, schedule but every I, But I think it's a problem also sometimes of efficiency. And there is a real important uh, the previous screen. Uh, uh, before to treat uh, the patient, uh, but uh, uh, there is an individual uh, uh, feature of uh, every every patient. But we have uh, other questions. Uh, in terms of treatment selection, when would you choose to use uh, facial manipulation instead of another uh, treatment? What's your reasoning uh, between to guide your treatment selection? Well, I don't think I ever choose not to use FM. And it depends on what we mean exactly by fashion manipulation, because to me, I'm always using the method. Um, and and uh, Larry Steinbeck has said this, and I totally agree, that I don't think it's as important what tool you use. It's, it's more important where are you going to work on somebody. So what therapeutic intervention you choose, I think, is less important than where you choose to go. I always use fashion manipulation to help me decide where I'm going to go. I usually will start with manual techniques and doing, you know, the shear. I'll use the, the tools um, in the FM model. Um, and if I can't get a point to resolve, I might bring in the laser. I, I might use it then. Or if something keeps, you know, just is too painful for the person, I might use something else. I might use some heat. I have ultrasound here. I didn't even bring that up. And Larry and I have talked about, you know, could we, would ultrasound be helpful? I haven't experimented with it enough to know. But when a point won't resolve, oftentimes I'll go work on a different spot. But sometimes I might, I might put some heat on it. I, I, I just might, I might try some, just something else that day, maybe some stretching. So, but I'm, I'm always using FM. It's, it's just a matter of, 
um, at least to get me to that place I'm using uh, FM. Colina, I think that uh, FM is a mentality, is a uh, is our mind, is a logic, and uh, is yeah. not only a treatment uh, right. to approach our patient. But uh, by Fabio or Fornitz, um, do you think that using FM might help preventing uh, OA has uh, high? Yeah, cost? right. Like the the tall African girl I showed. I think so. I mean, this is why I harp about dysmenorrhea. I don't think we need to just medicate these girls or give them birth control. The birth control helps the pain, but it doesn't change the underlying problem. And then if, if they go off birth control and want to have children, this is when these problems manifest. Yeah, I, I would love to have that opportunity to have intervened before they get in so much trouble. So I, there is no literature that would support what I'm saying because nobody looks at it. Um, it. It could be an incredible study for what would happen down the road if you had two groups, one of them got intervention with their dysmenorrhea, one didn't, and how did it go for them then later on in life? Yes, there is a, there is a, a huge problem in the design of uh, the trial and uh, uh, this uh, uh, this is the problem, but I think that the role of FM is uh, uh, is crucial to the prevention of uh, uh, dysfunction uh, of the fascia before uh, to the organic diseases. Uh, so we have uh, another uh, another question by Takamune uh, Moto. How many points you choose if more than six points uh, needs to be treated? Oh, well, part of that depends on how far behind I am. <laughs> um, I, that's a lot of points. I, a lot of times I don't even get to six points in treatment. I think part of that is because I see people that have some pretty chronic points and it can take longer. Um, how, many, how many do I choose? I, I try to have a strategy. We all should. And I'll usually, I'll usually maybe identify six or more. But I'll try to go maybe do that distal, proximal distal detensioning so that if I'm finding a point in the pelvis, in the hip, the knee, and then down at the foot, I'm going to go to the pelvis and I'm going to go to the foot and I'm going to see if the ones in between will resolve or at least improve on their own. Um, I, try, I, do, I, I try to make my choices with what's going to be the most effective for that person and in, in reality what I what I can finish. I, I tell people I'm not going to start something I can't finish. So I'd rather not start it than start it and not be able to finish it. So if that means I don't start on six points, then I don't. Another thing that I do, I really encourage my patients to get some of those percussion tools. Um, like I was showing in there, the, the hypervolt or there's cheaper versions of it. And that's going to be one thing that's on my blog site is what are good tools. Um, I'll put a Sharpie mark on people sometimes so they can go home and continue the work on the point, or maybe even work on it some themselves with their percussion tool. Then they come back the next time and it's prepped and it, it might be gone, or at least it might be much easier to resolve. It works nicely, especially for someone who's had long standing chronic problems. They have them all over the place. It did, and it lets, I think it's empowering to help these people know something that they can do in between visits, but also how they can help themselves. Uh, we have uh, uh, other questions uh, by our colleague. One moment. Uh, one uh, is uh, mm, is this. Uh, have you much research out there about the use of FM after hernia surgery and the outcome it could play to recovery? Oh, the research? I don't know how to answer that one. I just don't know, I, but I've never, I've never really done a search for that. Um, I know I like knowing about hernias because to me, it's almost, it's kind of like a diastasis rectus abdominis, um, which I'm always looking for in everybody. To me, it's a sign of a trunk that isn't elastic enough. Um, now, maybe it's in a person who has so much hypermobility, so much elasticity in their connective tissue and not enough collagen that it's going to happen anyway. But I think there's always an element of there's probably abnormal 
tension and abnormal elasticity in the trunk that would play into that. I think it's, I don't really know what to think about the babies, like the, um, when, a, when an infant's born and they have, a, they have an infant hernia. I, I, don't, I don't know that, that what I'm saying lines up with that, but I know when I, when I get a patient who's had uh, a hernia, and really to me, it's the same thing as a pelvic organ prolapse, the hernia, whether it's a, a umbilical or a inguinal or a hiatal, there's, I want to look for and make sure that there's not a loss of slide creating abnormal, a, a loss of elasticity in the trunk. Um, after hernia surgery, I mean, if it was in a, a, you know, they're they're fresh out of it, I wouldn't be working around the area until I know the scars all healed. Um, I think just like the dysmenorrhea management with um the IUD or the birth control pills, if you just do the hernia surgery and maybe use mesh, you haven't addressed the loss of elasticity and the compromise in the trunk that led it to happen in the first place. Um, but having said that too, even if you had a fresh hernia surgery and you're seeing that person for some reason, you could work distal, you could work remote, like there's probably something down the lower limb. So really while you were waiting for that to heal, it might help if you work down in the lower limb. Is it just, yes. you know, depends on where the, the hernia is and all. Yes, I think it's an important role also of the facial manipulation as a sort of remodeling tool for uh, the, the various tissue, not only uh, of the fascia, but the use of the facial manipulation restore of the conditions of the other tissue also. But we have the last two questions. Uh, and fast questions. Uh, one is, uh, do you think uh, that uh, using a FAM can prevent POP, the prolapse? Yeah. Um, well, I was, I had that one lady that I worked on her medio genu and she had pelvic organ prolapse. Um, I do. I have no evidence of that. <laughs> it's hard to prove something that you prevent. That's a hard one to prove. It takes a lot of numbers before you can be reasonably sure that your intervention did that. So I certainly don't have that. But in for for my way of thinking, I think fascia manipulation and and recognizing dysfunction in the fascia, especially into the lower limb, is the best explanation for pelvic organ prolapse that there is. The 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 literature and, and a lot of the courses emphasize that it happens because you have a weak pelvic floor. And yet the strengthening of the pelvic floor doesn't seem to help it. So, and the literature does show that. So it makes sense to me that if you have a force that's pulling from the lower limb and it's attached to an organ, why wouldn't it be taking the path of least resistance? For some people that might be the inguinal hernia. For other people, that might be the pelvic organ prolapse. So I think if you could intervene early enough and resolve the densifications in the lower half of the body, I think there's a very good chance you could prevent the pelvic organ prolapse. And I can say from my clinical experience that I've in working with this model, I've experienced change with prolapse for a lot of patients by yes. using this stuff. Yes. We have the last question, Colleen, and uh... This is uh, any suggestions uh, for treatment of vulvodynia? Mm -hmm. it, it was on that list. And what I, what I really want to emphasize is that I don't treat it any differently than what I've described. I, would, I, I do movement tests if there is a, a movement deficit, I note it. If there's not, I move on and I go to palpation. I palpate lumbar, pelvic, talus, pes. I palpate those areas and I'm working on whatever fascial densifications I find. I don't get too hung up on what somebody wants to call it because the, the diagnosis of vulvodynia is, is not very clear as to you know, how it's arrived at, what are the diagnostic criteria for it. Um, you can see different practitioners who might call it something else. So I, I encourage you guys to not get hung up on the diagnoses, really even in orthopedics, but especially in pelvic care, that's why I made that whole list of diagnoses. I do the same thing with all of them. Yes. Colleen, thank you so much for your interesting speech, uh, for uh, the explanations of your work, of your job, and the use of the FAM for uh, this uh, particular type of uh, diseases that are an important prevalence 
and uh, high incidence in uh, high incidence in uh, uh, in the population, the female population. Uh, but not only, I think. Uh, so thank you so much again. I see you. I think uh, for another uh, speech uh, uh, in the next uh, in, in our next event. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, colleagues, uh, for your participation. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, remind you that uh, the next appointment uh, with uh, the uh, Wednesday webinars uh, organized by Facial Manipulation Institute by STECO will be Facial Manipulation at Detailed uh, Explanation Using the Keys History of an Injured Olympic Athlete as uh, the reference point by Stefan Oswald. Uh, on Wednesday in April uh, on uh, 2028 uh, uh, at the same time. Uh, so good uh, uh, good evening and uh, see you for uh, for uh, the next uh, the next event uh, for the next webinar. Bye bye.